Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 822. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 19th, 2023. All right, thank you for joining us for another wonderful episode of Anglican Unscripted. How do I know it's wonderful? It, it will be wonderful. Most of our shows are amazing, full of content and, and fun and frivolity. And yes, I'm back inside Sasquatch. Uh, we picked her up from the dealership where they found the missing part that took two months to, to locate and install. And, um, you know, just for fun, they said, hey, why don't we just charge you a lot of money? So uh, <laughs> I'm not broke, but ouch. Ow! You've, you've had expensive car, car repairs. You had a, a car hit by lightning once. Uh, God, I remember we had, <laughs> Oh, and they didn't believe it. Uh, the insurance USAA didn't believe me, but it was at the... Uh, <laughs> and all the electrics were fried inside and out, uh, but hey. Yeah. But, so uh, all, all we had replaced, and I'm showing you right now, is a, it's a steering knuckle where the bearings were welded off the, uh, the knuckle a little bit because the, the bearings broke and uh, the knuckle overheated and everything imploded and exploded. And this one little piece took two months to find. And we found it, it's installed, we're back on the road. The only problem is if it ever happens again, it'll be another two, three, four months. We'll have to have one built. But that's, yeah, but that's you, our you get very a gold You really should. I mean, this <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, worth okay. its weight yeah. in gold. And yeah, you're yeah. not exaggerating when you say that. No. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, we're still, trying to be honest. Silver, okay. Well, we're honest with our audience. Okay, uh, this part new when they were still making was four hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. This part from a salvage yard in Kentucky, where I had to uh, convince Bo and Luke Duke to go out there and cut it off an old RV, was four thousand dollars. So it's you know it, it's a bit of a markup, but Bo and Luke went out there and and uh, got the welding torch and took it off a, a broken down RV and sent it to me, and then I took it to the shop and they said, well we have to pull the old one off and put the new one on, and that'll be eight thousand dollars. <laughs> so, Kevin, how much do you love our vein? I love our vein, I do. Ooh. So you know that those are quick updates for us. <laughs> Well, the cars I drive, Kevin, and you've seen my cars, at $8,000 repair, it's what they call write-off time. Right They're on, not yes. worth $8,000. The uh, cost of say, fixing is more than its value. Yeah, I mean, uh, th this is a very nice uh, RV. And when you, when you think about uh, keeping it alive, which is what we did for that amount of money, um, it's our home, you know? It's it's an it investment. Was, was this RV made by SpaceX? I mean, can you is Elon Musk going to shoot you into orbit with it? No, I mean, is that no, that's it, the prices that it, it's better than that. This is a Tiffin. This is a top of the line used RV that we purchased. And anybody in the comments who knows what a Tiffin is will say, yeah, it's worth it. So, George, we need to move on to our news, not just talk about what's going on in our our fiscal lives. Uh, if you want to read a really good article, I need you to go to anglican.inc and click on the picture of Manir Anis. He is talking about the biggest topic going on in Anglicanism, and that's the, the torn fabric. You know, the, the brokenness that we have because the people... I met a high school friend uh, a year ago. He goes, I see on Facebook you're the, an Anglican. Why are you an Anglican? I said, I'm an Anglican because it, it has sound doctrine, but it's run by the Keystone Cops. You know, there's just no good leadership globally in the Anglican. He goes, I get that, you know. Isn't that like every denomination? That's the point. We become like every other denomination. And I think Manier Nice is expressing that frustration here. He's saying that our leadership, known as the Archbishop of Canterbury, has put... Um, the Anglican Communion as a whole in crisis, and it's time to do something different. It would be absolutely crazy to continue in our ways. And George, I like the article. Now, on one level, folks, it's not going to say anything new about what's gone bad in the past. In other words, all the problems that we've seen over the last generation and a half are laid out again. So there's nothing really new there. But what is new is that who's making these observations and his recommendations for the way forward. Um, 
Muni or Nice, about 10 years ago, uh, was one of the conservative leaders, but he was not in lockstep with, say, uh, Peter Akinola and, uh, and the, the Nigerians. In other words, he was more, okay, let's work it out. We need to maintain our relationships with Canterbury. We need to bring them back on board, the Church of England and the Americans. Let's find a way to make this work. Uh, Munir is way past that now. And now he is basically saying, uh, he has a statement, which we highlighted in the article, uh, that Justin Welby, as Archbishop of Canterbury, has publicly stated and affirmed that his responsibilities to the Church of England are greater than his responsibilities to the Anglican Communion. And when those responsibilities uh, are in conflict, it's the Church of England that wins every time for Justin. If that's the case, which is the case, Munir is saying we need a new way of organizing ourselves. Archbishop of Canterbury would just be then, should be like the Church of Nigeria, or the Church of Ireland, or the Church of this, the Church of that, the Archbishop. And we need to have a primate elected from amongst the rest of the archbishops to be our central figure, the first among equals. And second, Munir is actually pushing something old that you and I, Kevin, were there for its death, which is an Anglican covenant. That we have something more than just a shared uh, charge account at the clergy outfitters uh, that keep us uh, in fellowship. That we have an agreed understanding of what the gospel means, what how we... In other words, at once upon a time, 50, 60 years ago, an Anglican priest was an Anglican priest anywhere in the world to, in an Anglican church. Today, an Anglican priest is not automatically transferable. Uh, his doctrine, it can be so different as to be almost a different faith, uh, not a different denomination, but a different faith <laughs> Interface, between one yes. church and another. <laughs> and Munir is saying that... Um, no, not enough attention has been paid by the man at the top. Um, George Carey did a good job in a difficult circumstances. Rowan Williams tried his best, but basically he came up with the covenant idea, but then he torpedoed it himself when it looked like the Americans and some liberals wouldn't go along. Justin Welby has no, doesn't give a darn about that. Well, uh, let's back up a step as to how many, how much time does it take to be an Archbishop of Canterbury? Rowan Williams flew around trying to put fires out and called meetings together. We need to put out the fire that the Episcopal Church started and smooth things over. And that was a full-time job. Rowan didn't have a lot of time to give back to England. Can the next Archbishop of Canterbury be in the sole role as, as Archbishop to help put out the fires and not have to worry about his own um, uh, province? Uh, well, if you look at it, it from an English it, perspective... Yeah. Okay. Well, didn't Justin say uh, this is too big a role for um, one person? Well, Jimmy Carter said that about being <laughs> yeah, That's right. <laughs> so, you know, it, consider the source. <laughs> yes, but sir, from an English perspective, the Church of England's in free fall. It's in crisis. You need somebody yeah. to devote their full-time energy to that. Anglican Communion is an additional added... It, it, that's a luxury for from people from the Church of England's point of view who are trying to get this thing straightened out. But if you're Manir and Nice or if you're Kevin and George, it's not a luxury. It's an essential aspect of it. Um, so basically, the ecclesiology, how we order ourselves, needs to be settled. And we can't keep continuing with these political settlements and kicking the can down the road. Because you know, one of the little stories we had is a Episcopal, uh, a Diocese of Maryland press release about their new bishop. Looks like a lovely woman, uh, but the picture has generated a picture with her with three or four other women uh, clergy, no male clergy that could be seen at the consecrating site, has just sparked s such comments, um, both about her attire and this and that, which really isn't what we should talk about. No. But, you know, she's fully into the woke agenda, pro-LGBT, pro-transgender, pro-woke, pro-personal pronouns. Pro-female pro cl pro clergy. Pro-abortion, <laughs> pro all this stuff. Yeah. And what does this person have in common with, say, somebody like me 
or an African minister or a South American minister or things like that in terms of understanding the, the creeds, understanding is the Bible trustworthy and true or do we allow our experiences or in our emotions and opinions? Mm -hmm. Where's our duty uh, to the church that has gone before us to uphold the doctrine of discipline? Well, no longer exists because we have a duty to uh, live the gospel of Frank Sinatra. We got to be me. We got to be free. And no, I have to have nothing against the new Bishop of Baltimore, Maryland. I don't know her. Um, and I'm sure she's no, uh, honest in her opinion. She believes what she says. Sure. Well, you, we say that we have nothing against her. I have something against bad shepherds. Mm -hmm. Okay. My ministry is to point out and help correct bad shepherds. From what I see of her statements, she will be a bad shepherd. She may be a good person, you know, but as a shepherd of a church, uh, of a, a diocese, you know. But Kevin, I really have to think, this is presumptuous on me, and we have one or two commentator, uh, commentators on our YouTube channel who let, enjoy pointing this out. But the, uh, I don't think she really, just like Catherine Jeffords' story did, sure it did really did not understand and have a relationship with god mm -hmm. as evidenced by her statements and her understanding of the christian faith what's when i talk about we have different faiths we really do her experience of the divine is not my experience and i don't mean in a personal sense but who is this god that we are are in relationship with i think Catherine jefford shorey outlines what is wrong with the episcopal church now she had, as a scientist, questions about faith, and she went to a church to attend to those questions. That church happened to be a very liberal Episcopal church and set her off on the wrong course in her faith. She was, you know, and they somehow decided to promote her and, and, and take her on up the chain. But when you go to a church, you should be able to, to find answers to these questions that are the correct answers not liberal answers but godly answers that would lead you to having a transformed life mm. um and if that's not happening what's the point of church if it's not there to transform the individual believer what's the point and, and this is munir's point you're at, you're spot on kevin because munir's point is that unless if we do not have the institutions that enable this to occur then we need to get a new communion, a new way of relating to one another, because the current one, it's a fraud. It's simple as that, it's a fraud. No doubt. All right, let's move on to our next news story. Let's see. oh, our friend, friend of the program, Jeff Walton, has uh, published the deep statistics for the Episcopal Church uh, that were just published by General, uh, General what's it called, Senate. And uh, we need to go through this because the slide continues. Maybe not in Central Florida, but uh, uh, my home's uh, Diocese of Connecticut and, you know, Jeff lists many more. Uh, the membership slide has continued and it's had its biggest one year drop, 6%. Yeah, and Central Florida had a drop too. Um, yeah. Hopefully we'll see a change with the new bishop, but Jeff, Jeff Walton reported that the Episcopal uh, General Convention Office yesterday released the statistics on 2022 attendance. Uh, 2021 was a truncated year, meaning I think the churches were closed six, nine months in some cases. 2022 was the uh, first year fully back. And what this, sh and what this showed was that membership fell from 2021 to 2022 by six percent and over the past 10 years 23 percent of the members have disappeared now probably it's due to death and aging and moving to mm -hmm. florida for people <laughs> up north now there's good news is that attendance was up 19 percent over the prior year, 56,000 more people were in the pews on Sunday. And I'm sure that will be pushed as the good news. But when you're only up 56,000 people, 
when the prior year you were closed for nine months. Um, that's not really an accomplishment. We're nowhere near where we were prior to COVID. Yeah. So there's, so what we're seeing, COVID has been a disaster for the Episcopal Church. For and, all churches, but and to be fair, all denominations suffered. Yeah, and we're seeing the numbers. Um, mm -hmm. Something like 55% of parishes in the Episcopal Church are now in long-term decline, meaning dropping over 10% over the past five years. Uh, I can. I think that's true. I, I know that to be true, and that uh, in my own church, for instance, uh, we're not one of those 55%. We're actually growing. But if I, I, I'm, I love numbers, and I take attendance every Sunday, and I know who was here this Sunday, and I'm able to compare it to, a, say, a, the same Sunday three or four or five years earlier. And what I'm finding is that rate of turnover in my church is very high. We got a lot of people moving, dying, this, that, and the other. What we're replacing them, and what's happening is that most Episcopal churches are seeing the natural attrition because we're older group. We have people like because of COVID not coming back, but they're not replacing them with new people. Jeff started out his article comparing Resurrection Anglican Church, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, Restoration Anglican Restoration, Church yeah, yeah. in Arlington. Uh, has uh, seats, uh, has an average Sunday attendance of 495 in a church that seats 370. While the National Cathedral, which seats 3,000, has an average Sunday attendance of 423. And this is the flagship church of the Diocese of Washington. So that a suburban Virginia church is now, in Anglican terms, more things are happening there not at the cathedral now the cathedral's well, got a lot of money but uh I, don't I, I think he makes the point here you know among the hardest hit uh for membership were southwest virginia uh down at 11 percent 12 percent uh, maryland 14 percent bethlehem uh, 12 newark another 11 puerto rico 22 you know these are major membership declines um, some of the, some of those are well, you know, we can look at each of them and find each circumstances. Bethlehem, sure. Rust Belt, Pennsylvania. Yeah, people are not graduating from college and saying, "Hey, I watched episodes of The Office. I want to move to Scranton too." No, <laughs> that, that's not happening. People are leaving northeastern Pennsylvania. Yeah. People are leaving uh, northern New Jersey with their move. If you've got an older crowd, when they hit their sixties, they take off. Um, many times for the South or for Arizona or Florida or things like that. Um, Puerto Rico has a bad bishop. He's one of these guys who's at war with his clergy all the time. So, you know, these things. So there are various reasons, but we get back to the previous story. The leadership isn't there. The vision isn't there. The uh, George Bush, the, the elder, you'd like to talk about the vision thing. Um it's absent from many parts of the Episcopal Church. And in theological terms, I would say in many parts of the Episcopal Church, perhaps the majority of places on the diocesan level, the Holy Spirit is absent. Um, God is doing, in Gene Robinson's word, a new thing, but he's not doing it in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> he's doing it in, in uh, the ACNA, he's doing it in Hooterville here in Florida. Uh, but he's not doing well, it in the old bastions of power and influence. Uh, Gene is correct. Uh, the Holy Spirit is doing a new thing. He's now made much of the Episcopal Church a non-transformational church. You, you can't go into a church and find the gospel. Not oh. all, not all, much. Now, Kevin, I'll take uh, an issue with that. Oh, please some, do. Episcopal, okay, yeah. some Episcopal churches are transformational. They're really into this transgender stuff. So they <laughs> say that, All right. remember, General Convention <laughs> supported a child's right to uh, genital mutilation and castration as a God-given right. So they are into mm -hmm. transformation, just not the type that you were thinking about. Well, I, I drove by a, a United Methodist Church. It said, uh, um, 
transgenderism did not start with us. It started with God, and they, they pointed out the verse of the transfiguration uh, as their, um, I don't, I just like, <laughs> that. that's the biggest step I've seen in a week <laughs> in bad doctrine. And so, yeah. Okay, okay. You and I could but, have a show where we watch bad sermons and comment on them. Full, we'd make a million dollars. Well, we had we had a little uh, press release we put out, and I and I had to say I did it to troll people. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the second most popular person, woman of the Episcopal Church for Anglican unscripted Anglican ink readers is after Catherine Jefford Shorey is Catherine Hancock Ragsdale, the abortion is a blessing priest and former dean of the Episcopal Divinity School. She's the one that was able to single-handedly drive that church out, that, that seminary out of business. And the article was she's landed on her feet again and is now interim dean of a Moravian seminary in Lancaster, PA. Well, in the comment section that followed this story and on Facebook and whatnot, the comment was, well, the Episcopal Church, all these, the people who have the power are all putting these, you know, putting their buddies and friends in positions of influence. And then I just stopped reading this and I thought, well, I'm going to comment on this guy's comment, but no, I think I'll save it for Anglican Inc. Because, friends, these people may have institutional authority, but they have no power whatsoever because they're totally disconnected to the power of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, people say to me, George, why do you not just run for the hills because, you know, you're an Episcopalian? And I say, well, apart from the pension fund, um, <laughs> The power of Christ is present when two or three of us are gathered together in prayer and we're faithful to his word and we live out his imperatives in this little place. Why do I need to worry about people who think they have authority when they have no authority whatsoever? Because all authority comes from God. It doesn't come from them. They may not have the authority, but they certainly have a, a destructive mind, and uh, uh, they're kicking, trying to kick out those who have authority, uh, and, and they're trying to train up the new authority, people who have authority. So, it, it, it's a mess, George. There's no no doubt about that. Let's move on to our next story. We're going all the way to the diocese of northern Mexico. It's in crisis. Um, there was an election not too long ago, and the claim is it was fraudulent. And this is different because in northern Mexico, the bishop himself has ownership of the properties. After the Mexican Revolution, they said, we need to fix some things here. We'll make sure that the bishop is uh, head of all the property. Well, if the bishop thinks something's fraudulent and he owns all the property, who's in control, George? This is a tough story because the primary sources are in Spanish and I speak Spanglish. Uh, in other words, I can order I can order uh, Taco Bell. Uh, those tacos, por favor, okay. But when we get into higher issues, I have to uh, get out my dictionary. Uh -huh. Well, you're right. In 1912, I think the Mexican Revolution, they passed the anti-clerical laws, which are still mm -hmm. on the books. One of those laws was that religious corporations may not own property or hold assets. And so for a church, that meant that the assets, the building bank accounts the property no longer below were managed by a corporation but were invested in a what we call the united states business practice a corporate soul meaning the 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 corporate soul meaning has one's principal it's the bishop the bishop in essence owns and manages the property this was the problem that hat with john bruno had in los angeles where he was basically popular property speculating with the diocese assets well a new election in northern Mexico, and it's very bitterly contested. And some people were sort of brought in to vote who really shouldn't have voted, as best as I can make out. And what has happened is the Anglican Diocese of northern Mexico appears to have taken on the character of the society around it, around them, which is the cartels. And the former bishop of northern Mexico, who's also the former primate of the Anglican Church of Mexico, has put out a pastoral letter saying... The new bishop is a fraud. He and his cronies among the clergy are basically robbing the diocese, of mortgaging properties, emptying bank accounts. It's a criminal enterprise. And 
there's very little that can be done about this because of the legal structures. Unless the Anglican Church of Mexico goes in and deposes him, which is a hard thing to do because money gets spread around to make sure the, these things don't happen, uh, we'll see the Anglican Church, Diocese of Northern Mexico, basically its faithful Christians are being driven away because of the corruption and because of the narco uh, cartel character of its leadership. Now, I'm not saying they're into drug dealing, I don't know that, but just the sort of ethos of criminality that is so perviating, permeating northern Mexico at this time has infested the church. Well, it has. I mean, one of the biggest problems you have is the kickback culture. Mm -hmm. And when you're a bishop and you have the ability not just to own the properties, but to distribute funds and um, financial assets to those people who agree with you and, and, and uh, find a future in your fortune, that's power. Well, I mean, in northern Mexico, when parishioners give money, it doesn't stay in the parish, it goes to the diocese. Right. And then the bishop pays the salary of the clergy. And if you don't support the bishop, you're cut off. You don't get <laughs> you any are. money. Now, this uh, helps in ACNA diocese. Yes, the diocese of the southwest is growing. But it's not because Anglicans in New Mexico are just appearing out of the desert because of some uh, nuclear test bomb. You know, it's the mutant Anglicans at White Sands. Zombies, yes. R rather, uh, the Anglican diocese is expanding in Mexico. Um, small communities, it's really almost like Book of Acts time. I, have, I, I put it in that terms. It's exciting to watch and read their emails. It's a small diocese. We're not talking about tens of thousands of people becoming sure. Anglicans last year. But we're seeing communities of dedicated Christians arising in towns across northern Mexico who are faithful to the gospel, who just don't want any part of the Anglican Church of Mexico and the culture of corruption that is endemic in their society. And so these are people who really are being countercultural in Mexico because they're standing for the gospel. All right, so let's go into our next story. Right after GAFCON, George swam the Tiber for like, what, a week? You went over to, uh, to Rome and you took some exorcism classes and you learned about exorcism and whether it's something you wanted to do and something you wanted to bring back to your diocese but you knew you'd have to get the permission of your bishop to do so, and you wanted to wait because you're having a new bishop. You got the new bishop. Now, let's just talk about exorcism as Hollywood thinks that exorcism is a real thing, and they always bring some wrinkled, uh, slightly gray-haired guy to, to do exorcisms in their films. And then there is real exorcisms. It's certainly been documented. And then there's wacko exorcisms. And the, the, the wacko exorcisms are where uh, we take a person who has autism and we say, you are with demon, we will cast him out. Or take, you know, any, name anything uh, in an ailment. And it's something that we must cast out. In the south, south of the Mason-Dixon line, there are many churches just devoted to deliverance ministries. What? It's a cat, right? As soon as you talk about <laughs> deliverance ministry, a black cat walks across the screen. <laughs> and, and so uh, it, it, there's many churches called deliverance churches, and they're to, there to deliver you from your demons. And this is now made news uh, in New Zealand, George. Well, I... This isn't an Anglican story, but it is a story that interests me because of my interest in work in the exorcism field. Mm -hmm. um, this is how this is a story of how not to do things and how it can go badly awry. Uh, background: 2007, a group of uh, the Congregation of the Sons of the Most Holy Redeemer it was a religious order that at the time was affiliated with the Society of Saint Pius X, the SSPX. They're the ones that uh, ultra conservative traditionalist Catholics. They set up shop in Christchurch, New Zealand, built a priory and whatnot. And 
they eventually were reconciled with the Catholic Church in New Zealand and came under the jurisdiction of the local bishop. Uh, they're also called the uh, Re Transalpine Redemptorist Fathers. Well, they did their little thing and they used the pre-Vatican II uh, ritual books and they were basically allowed to carve out a little niche for traditionalists. Well, it came to the bishop's attention that they were performing exorcisms. Catholic canon law says that you must have the bishop's permission in writing before you do any sort of exorcism. Now, any person may do a deliverance, meaning I pray in the name of Jesus for this person to be healed. Mm -hmm. it's, an exorcism is when you pray in the name of the church by the authority granted to by God to the church, the keys of the kingdom idea, which we have in Catholicism. We have it in Anglicanism as well. Christ gave the keys of the kingdom to the minister of the church to bind on earth and loose on earth things that are bound and loosed on heaven and right. so on and so on. Well, this order was doing exorcisms in the name of the church, trying to drive out demons. But what they were not doing was they were doing no psychological or medical evaluations before they did these prayers. And so they were trying to exercise people, as you mentioned, with autism, with schizophrenia, uh, with brain tumors. And the it rose to the level of, of civil charges of fraud and misconduct by people who had been tra treated and wound up worse from the attempted exorcisms by this Catholic order, such that the bishop in Christ Church, Michael Galen, has said nobody is allowed to do any exorcism. And if you do it without my permission, you're going to be, ex you don't ask what happens, it's going to be bad. This points to the need, my my understanding of exorcism, which is you're not a lone ranger. You're not a freelancer. Um, you may pray for other people. You may seek the power of Christ in Jesus' name to do stuff. But when you take it on yourself that in the in I standing in the in the place of the church cast out this demon, if you do so without a connection to the church, you're basically a lone ranger, and what happens is this sort of thing, where pride and, and, and pride and all this stuff drives you. And in fact, I think you probably need more spiritual care than the people with schizophrenia that you're treating. So, I mean, yeah. it, 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 this is it, it's like playing with hand grenades. You know, you really shouldn't try to juggle them until you know if it's inert or not, or or anything like that. Well, I mean, that's where we get a bad reputation as Christians because they're doing something horrible and it, it represents us. Mm -hmm. Oh, look what these bad Christians are doing over here. They're picking on uh, people with mental illness. So they're picking on people with autism. And, and they think it's not autism. They think there's demons. And we know it's autism. They're know, charging so. fees for this stuff. I mean, <sighs> so. I mean, you're not supposed to charge money for this stuff. And they're charging <laughs> money. And so... Oh, my. Okay. Let's uh, move on and uh, finish up our show here. Uh, what happens in the Diocese of Florida post-Bishop-elect um, Charlie Holtz stepping back and saying uh, the process is over? <laughs> the Episcopal Church has spoken, certainly not the diocese. What do we do now? And it looks like uh, it's time for the Diocese of Florida to invoke Indaba. Charlie Holtz had to return all the purple shirts uh, to the clerical tailors because he's not going to be bishop. Mm -hmm. And they've now entered facilitated conversation with somebody from the National Church office, Mary Gray Reeves, former bishop of El Camino Real, who's very liberal, trying to bring the two sides. Now realize we're talking about 85, 15, 80, 20, yeah, 80 percent being the tradi ten. traditionalists. Yeah. Yeah. And the 10, 15, 20 being the liberals. She's trying to have facilitated conversations so that people can hear each other. And I read the letter from the standing committee that came out yesterday. And we published it on Anglican Inc. And basically, as this is a cynical evaluation, but it seems to me that 815 is laying the tracks for Florida to go the way of Albany. And when they do eventually elect another bishop, it'll be somebody where 
you're elevating the minority view on human sexuality to make it equal, but then you're adding the kicker that the rest of the Episcopal Church thinks that the minority view should be the majority view. And what goes from being, you know, John Richard Newhouse's, you know, what was once tolerated soon becomes illegal Absolutely. Uh, in theological views. We're yeah. seeing that pr process start in Florida. Um, I just, I feel very badly for brothers and sisters in Florida who want the best for their diocese, but they've started playing a game which they are not going to win. No, I mean, the Episcopal Church has its own willowing. And when they find out that they have the ability to promote a small minority into equal status, and, mm -hmm. and when you promote it to equal, it just became 51% because you have the backing of the Episcopal Church. Um, and so you have the liberals are at 51%. Uh, and, oh, but we have mutual flourishing. We should respect each other's opinions on these things. So, you know, it, that has worked nowhere. You know, merch, one of the mutual, viewers flourish, mutual flourishing is a lie. One of the viewers of our show looked into uh, who was leading the charge against Charlie Holt. And it was from a group of parishes, all of whom were dying. So the growing, prosperous, happy, alive Florida parishes with kids and new people and Boy Scouts and Sunday schools and all the stuff that you want to see in a church, the spirit is at work. They're the ones back in Charlie Hope. The dying churches are the ones that uh, were against him. And now the national church is essentially empowering the dying clergy who seem to have time on their hands because they don't have any people to take care of to infect the rest of the diocese with the poison that has broken their parishes. All right, next story. It's an odd story, but it's a 21st century story. Uh, George has been a victim of cybercrime, your church has. And it's happening more and more around the country. Now with AI, they're able to disguise the voices. One of the biggest concerns I keep telling my mom, grandma, if the kids call and ask for money, it's a fraud. Okay. Oh, it sounds just like them. No, they, they have artificial intelligence that can now uh, dis disguise voices to sound like your grandkids. And I've taught them never to ask for money from you. They have to come to me. Okay. I'll come to you for money. I'm, I'm your son. But <laughs> and so crime and cyber crime is, is a real uh, thing that's affected the churches. Your church, uh, you can briefly talk about in a second, but now the, the Bishop of Virginia uh, has said that there's been a cyber crime uh, in his diocese. Somebody outside the diocese used a computer to get his money. Yeah, the... Bishop of Virginia, Mark Stevenson, uh, put out a pastoral letter reporting that the diocese has been hit with an $85,000 cybercrime. Uh, some diocese was going to make two distributions earlier this year to two, to, to, to two parishes. And these were scheduled distributions, part of the diocesan budget. You know, this church will get this and this church will get that for mission support. Well, the diocese initiated the transactions uh, on their end. And the parishes never got the money. And the parishes, after a month or so, they're sort of like embarrassed because, you know, like, you know, oh, do we really want to embarrass you, you know, by saying, where's the money you promised us? Um, and that I said, well, we sent it. And somebody had stepped into the middle of the process and redirected those funds to do bank accounts, which were opened, money deposited, money withdrawn, then closed, people disappeared. Now, they'll probably get insurance reimbursement, but I gotta tell you, this was not something I learned in seminary about how to manage things, how to avoid cybercrime. Hmm. Um, and it's especially hard in churches because so much of this is volunteer driven, almost all of it's volunteer driven. And based uh, on, on trust. parish level, yeah. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I'm getting ready for the 8 o'clock service and the LA Eucharist minister, Robert, who helps at 8 o'clock most Sundays. And at the time, he was the treasurer of the parish. He said, did you get the money? I said, what money? 
He said, well, I got an email from you on Friday saying that you needed an emergency distribution of about $3,000 for a pastoral crisis. And could you wire it to this bank account? And I said, it wasn't me. And turned out to be criminal fraud. Scan, we called the police, police check. Money went to a bank account that had been opened on the Thursday or something like that, close by. Sure. Money open, account open, money wired, money withdrawn, account closed. Um, we had insurance and we had coverage and Robert uh, basically paid it out of his own, paid any deductible we had out of his own pocket because he was so embarrassed. But the senior warden fired him as treasurer. Um, he's a volunteer and it's not that we're stupid or anything but you know as i and i've said to every treasurer since i will never ask you for money over the email or internet you know just if anybody and the thing is people get uh these emails that are ostensibly for me in the congregation saying could you go buy some Amazon gift cards sure. and then take a photo of the back of it because I need to do this for me and I don't want to embarrass anybody because it's for pastoral need and and so some of these old people will go to the our grocery store the Publix markets and buy Amazon cards and evidently it's a wide enough scheme that the uh, clerks there if an old person wants to buy a hundred dollar Amazon card or a Home Depot card or one of these store cards will stop and say, why are you doing this? And, but we've had a few parishioners who get stung by this. Yeah, so. it happened to my church, it happened to my church as well in Connecticut. Uh, elderly people in the church in their 70s got this frantic email from the, the church head office, so to speak, asking for $2,000 in um, Amazon cards. You know what they did? They bought the cards. They sit, and they, the cards were picked up by a, a uh, delivery driver, so to speak, uh, arranged for by the, the scammer. And it's so easy because people are so trusting. And we don't want to lose yeah. that trust. We want to keep that you, trust. used to be a, a parish directory was a source of pride. You put a lot of work into making it look nice and pictures mm -hmm. and all the things and activities and all the information about everybody. But today, those are closely guarded simply because we don't want people photocopying them and then contacting people to defraud them supposedly in the name of the church yeah all right let's uh i got, I got time for one more story before i have to uh, break camp uh let's do an update from the viewers um we did a story last week where we commented on a uh, church of england retiring bishop and uh, uh we gave our opinion and other people have given their opinion and the cool thing about Angle Unscripted is we're not afraid to talk about tough topics uh, or afraid to be corrected or give updates. This is an update, George. There was a dead bishop on the landing. He didn't retire, he died. Bishop Dorgu mm -hmm. of Woolwich. He was a Nigerian. And I have not met the man, but those whom I know in the diocese of Southwark, where Woolwich is an area, bishop in that diocese, were not complimentary about him their accusation against him was that he was a bit of a sellout. Um, and that's what I repeated on the show. The head of the Evangelical Fellowship in Southwark said, I don't recognize the person you're talking about. He wasn't a sellout. Mm -hmm. Now, I have no bone in this fight. Uh, and But I do want to basically come back and say, the I've been directly challenged on the veracity of what I was told by one group uh, about him being a sellout, saying, well, nobody expected him to be a bastion of orthodoxy and this and that and the other. So it wasn't that he came under false pretenses or he sure. sold his soul for this job. He just was never like that to begin with. So it's important when people hear things like that, that we say that they're from their experience, uh, they want to raise and say, no, that's not how it is to tell us, because otherwise sure. we'll just repeat a false story or we'll not get it right or we'll get things slightly askew. Now, are we wrong? No, because the person I want to talk to originally said, well, yeah, that's one group view, but here's my view. So we've got. But no, it, it, this, this is the big part. There's two sides to every story, minimum. And that's what they'll teach you first week in journalism school back in the 50s. They don't teach that now. 
Now, journalists have learned there's one side of every story, and that's what you believe. <laughs> See, today in journalism school, they teach you that Heather can have two mommies, but Heather can have more than two genders. She can yeah. have 50 or 60 genders, you know, whatever. Toxic masculinity is horrible. Toxic femininity is the future. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it. <sighs> well... We got, we'll have to save the next two stories for uh, Friday if we get a chance to record. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 822 of Anglican Unscripted.